Hello everyone, welcome to the Brit Centre podcast with me, Tom. And me, Sam. How are you today, Sam? I'm well, thank you. Um, I've looked outside and it's raining, mm-hmm. um, but it's still really hot, I think. Well, really warm kind of, um, and humid. Um, it's been quite humid the last couple of days. Um, so I guess it's maybe a tiny bit similar to what the weather is like in Korea during the summer, mm. where it gets very humid. Um, so it's uh, yeah, it's it's an okay sort of temperature, but um, but yeah, apart from that, I'm I'm okay. How about you? I'm good, thanks. Uh, yeah, quite well, despite the yeah grey weather. It's very muggy and humid. Yeah. Fun little story yesterday i was sitting in my kitchen and with my parents because i'm at home at the moment with my parents and we've had some lightning in london at least i expect in other parts of the uk and there was a massive bang we didn't see a flash of light but a huge bang and some slates came down we think it was maybe some loose slate on the roof uh down into next to the kitchen outside wow um and then there was a the sound of thunder a few seconds after uh which is of course what happens with lightning you get the flash and then you get the sound a few moments later so we're pretty sure that the house was hit by lightning which is quite exciting Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. It's really cool. Quite fun. Uh, also a bit scary, obviously. <laughs> a little bit. Um, there doesn't seem to be any serious damage. I think it was sort of loose, sort of almost like spare. It's just like some sort of slate that wasn't really attached to anything, um, which obviously hadn't been cleared off the roof. Um, I imagine, if, imagine if you'd been outside. Exactly. Um, and there are quite a few trees around, which of course attract lightning. Um, yeah. But yeah. That was quite quite very loud. Lightning is very loud when it hits your house and when you're inside. So we all jumped. It... Oh yeah, so it made you jump, right? Yeah, it's like a massive oh, yeah. crack and a bang. Um, yeah, and then the rumble of thunder. So quite exciting. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, so that but, but ma- still makes quite frightening. Yeah. a little bit frightening. Yeah, and uh, but it it breaks up the monotony of mm. lockdown life. We're still sort of in a lockdown. Well, I suppose we're kind of coming out of lockdown, but still, fe- I'm still acting as if we are in lockdown. Yeah. Anyway, slightly changing the subject to the topic of today's podcast, which is British schools and paying particular attention to the different kinds of British schools in the education system. So Sam, this could be a tricky question, but I am confident that you have the answer. Can you summarize the different kinds of schools we have in the British education system? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a, a big task. Um, <laughs> uh, first of all, um, we have two main types of education in the UK similar to in other countries. Um, We have state education, education that is publicly funded, funded by the government. Um, And then we have private education. So that sounds very simple, but in the UK, there are many uh, nuances, many small differences between different types of private education and different types of state education. And before we talk about that though, I should say that we usually start school at the age of, oh, how old, how old? I think five, five years old. Yeah, unless you go to a kind of reception, like I know, you know, I know that like two and three year olds get put in nurseries, basically. Oh, nursery. Mm, Some, yeah, do that. Exactly. Yeah. So, so I think we start formal education. Mm. That means education that we must. Uh, do that we must um, undergo 
uh, when we were about five years old. But some people do go to nursery, which is kind of like preschool. I think they say preschool in America or kindergarten mm. before that. Um, and then we are there for um, a few years until we get to the age of 11, more or less. Um, and that is called primary school. So that's the first major part of schooling that we have. And when we are 11, we usually go to secondary school. Um, there are also middle schools in some parts of the country um, where people go for a, for a few years um, before they go to secondary school. But generally, people go to secondary school when they are 11 years old. And they finish secondary school when they are 16 years old. And at that point, they can either go to sixth form college, where they study for two years, um, and it's kind of a preparation for uh, university or for more academic work, or they go into an apprenticeship, which is kind of training for a job, or another type of college where they train uh, for work in a different way. So for example, if you want to be a carpenter, you can study carpentry um, at a college instead of going to sixth form college. Um, so that's the overall um, system that we have in terms of the ages and the different stages of school. But like I said, there's many differences between the specific types of private education and state education. So I went to what's called a comprehensive school, which is a state school. Um, you'll notice in the UK, we don't say public school when we talk about state education, because public school has a different meaning. It's very confusing. You know? um, so I, as I said, I went to a state school for secondary school, for primary school. Um, and Tom, I think you went to what we would call a public school. Um, can you explain what a public school is and, and how it's different to a state school? We often think of public schools as perhaps another term is often used as independent school. Mm. And a public school is one you have to pay money for. So you have to pay a fee. So you have school fees. So obviously that's paid for by the parents normally, of a public school. The reason why it's called public is because it's open to students regardless of where they come from, so regardless of where they are located um, or regardless of the profession of their parents. That's the kind of original idea for public school so that's the reason it had that name is because they weren't local schools whereas in the past you would go to the school that was most local to you and when public schools were created they were open to everyone outside of people who lived near the school but in actual fact we could argue they're not really open to everyone because you have to be able to afford to pay a fee and also a bit like grammar schools, which are another type of school that we haven't mentioned, which are a form of state school, you often have to pass tests in order to be offered a place at the school. So that's the same at grammar schools. You have to pass a test. So they only accept people who pass a specific academic standard. So I think that's a a kind of summary of public schools or independent schools, I suppose you could think of them as well. So, Sam, what would you say are the general perceptions or general stereotypes about the different kinds of school in Britain? So I think in the UK we have um, quite a strong perception um, of the different kinds of school. 
uh, that we have. So um, like you've just talked about public schools and I know certainly um, old and famous public schools like Eton College or um, Harrow, uh, which is another famous one that I live very close to, um, have a reputation for having amazing facilities. So having great uh, you know, sports fields and classrooms and um, standards, having very good standards. And um, they also, however, have a reputation for being elitist or part of um, the kind of posh culture or upper class culture that we have in the UK. Uh, we talked about class before a bit. And so um, often public schools in particular are connected to being upper class. Um, of course, that's not always true at all, but uh, that's kind of the reputation they have. So many famous actors, famous politicians, just famous people who went to public school have um, a posher accent when they speak English and a more upper class accent. So Hugh Grant, for example, um, Boris Johnson, the prime minister now, um, Benedict Cumberbatch, who, who went to Harrow. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think this, there is this idea of public schools being connected to being upper class and being part of the elite in the British class system. Um, how about state schools, Tom? What would you think the overall perception of comprehensive schools is? Well, again, I think it depends on the point of view we're talking about. So as someone who went to private school or public school, you can call it, uh, the perception of state schools was uh, biased in a negative way because, as you said, there is a kind of elitist culture that is very common at public schools, private schools, independent schools, that sees or tries to imbue in its students a sense of superiority and which also often comes from par the parents of the students as well, particularly if the parents are especially wealthy. So state schools are seen by the private school people as inherently inferior and because they're, you know, free to go to, you don't even have to pay to go to it. So, and I think m much of that is unjustified. So, however, among state schools, there is also prejudice and uh, inequality in terms of quality. So people are still keen to send, if they are sending their children to state schools, they have beliefs about which state school is better than which other state school. And it can be competitive to try to get your student into a state school, although it's free, it can have a kind of lottery style um, invite or offer where lots of people apply to a school to have their children uh, offered a place there and then it's chosen by a kind of lottery. I think a lot of the perception of state schools and education in general, the different kinds of education is influenced by the government of the time. So we've had a conservative government for 10 years and conservative governments tend to be supportive of private and independent and public schools, mainly because, or perhaps in at least in part, because many of the MPs or politicians of the Conservative Party come from private schools, or independent schools or public schools. And so there's a tendency for them to not properly fund state schools or certainly not offer the same kind of support that they offer to private schools. That doesn't necessarily mean monetary support because of course private schools are independently wealthy. But there have been cuts to things like playing fields, any kind of extracurricular opportunities offered by state schools. 
So it also depends very much on location. So some state schools are seen as failing and might have a very high expulsion rate. So meaning many, many students are expelled from the school, sent out of the school for bad behavior, whereas other state schools are competitive academically and uh, as good as, if not better than many private schools in terms of their academic attainment. So it's very hard to give a kind of general judgment about such schools because they really do vary from school to school. It's definitely true, yeah. State state schools um, vary dramatically. Um, so I, I went to what's considered quite a good state school in the countryside around Cambridgeshire. Um, but, you know, a few miles down the road where my uh, brother and sister, the, the state school that my brother and sister went to a few years before, um, for example, was, was famous for being a, a bad state school and, and having some problems. And, for example, they did not have any playing fields, so they had to use the local park area. Um, so, yeah, like you said, there's definitely big differences. Um, and I think I might be wrong, but I think there's also differences in the private school system too. Mm. So I think there are some private schools which are not so well-known, not so famous, and are fairly similar to state schools um, in terms of their their history, um, but obviously have slightly better facilities, whereas somewhere like Eton or Harrow has a very different reputation, is a very different and much older type of private or public school. I think it's also important to think about differences between the South Korean education system and our British education system. Um, so I think one of the biggest differences is uh, the number of hours that we, we study in the UK. Um, when I talk to students, it seems like South Korean students, when they're at school, study many hours at school, and then they also study many hours at home or uh, in tutoring classes. Um, can you think of any other big differences, Tom? Yes, I think certain things that have come up in my conversation with my students has been the lack of time that's available for playing basically or having fun or doing some kind of extracurricular activity like playing sports doing drama doing music this kind of thing it seems in south korea the focus is very much on the final exams before university, of course, these famous exams that cause a, a huge amount of stress, clearly, to students. Whereas in the UK, although we have big public exams, GCSEs and A-levels, they, although they are considered very important, they're not nearly as important as they are in South Korea. So I would say the stress that students go under, although it feels very stressful at the time for British students, I don't think it comes close to compare, comparing with the South Korean stress and pressure that is put on students there. And yes, to carry on with the previous point, very few of my students seem to have had any time to, say, play sports. So in many British schools, there's competitive sports on the weekends where you might play against other schools. Uh, if you have the facilities, if you have the opportunity to do that, there are often opportunities to play an instrument, for example, learn an instrument, maybe do some acting, some drama, something I enjoyed a lot, as well as sports. But in South Korea, many of these things seem to be sort of considered a waste of time. Uh, and as Sam, you were saying, the emphasis on extra learning after school, so going to an academy or having a tutor, in South Korea, is, it happens to a much, much greater extent than it does in the UK. And some conversations I've had have been very illuminating as to why that's the case. Um, 
again, I'd be interested to hear some comments about this uh, from any listeners, which is I've heard that because of the recent, relatively recent, rapid development of South Korea, turning into an advanced country with an advanced economy, a huge amount of weight has been put on education, the benefits of education. And as it's such a competitive society, you, of course, or parents, of course, feel like their children need to be better educated than other children in order to compete and succeed and have a good quality of life. Whereas I think in Britain, we've been sort of languishing as a nation for decades and we have kind of rested on our long history and our very high quality higher education and have somewhat neglected I think the primary and secondary education that we have not to say that we're producing badly educated citizens or anything like that but more that the the importance of education is not something that comes up as much in conversation in general. It does, for, of course, for parents, but it's not something that people are putting a huge amount of attention uh, on. So it's mm. many people coast through school and their parents don't put them under too much pressure. And it's seen as, well, you know, you, you should be able to get to university anyway, should be able to get a job, um, but I think now the younger generations are starting to realize the difficulty of getting jobs if you don't, if you're not um, flourishing or if you're not working hard. Um, but I don't think that has really come across yet in the education system. Another big factor being that teachers, the conditions for teachers have been deteriorating over the last few decades and many 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 more teachers are leaving the profession of teaching at schools because the conditions are so bad because the behavior of students is so bad the systems of discipline have kind of broken down completely and that has meant that as fewer teachers go to the profession there are fewer good teachers and therefore the education standards i think have slipped down the international rankings um, in terms of secondary education. What's your perspective on all of that, Sam? Well, I think that's true. I think that's um, also uh, in, from what I have heard in South Korean culture, like you said, there is much more of a, an emphasis and a focus on education um, and the importance of it. Um, and I think um, in the UK, like you said, our, our rankings have slipped. And that's, I think, yeah, there's definitely a difference in terms of our emphasis on education. I think one of the, the good parts of the British education system is that um, I think for British people, there is nothing wrong necessarily with choosing a vocation mm. um, instead of further education like university um, and that has changed recently um, in the past I think people viewed it in a different way um, but I think in, in South Korea possibly there's a different perception of that and that it's kind of generally not always considered a good thing to um, have a vocation instead of further education Whereas in the UK, um, there is nothing that's necessarily wrong with that. But like you said before, Tom, there still isn't enough funding, I think I would say, um, for, for all types of education in the UK. And um, there definitely are some aspects of the British education system that most people believe need to improve. Um, one big change, however, came a few years ago when the government started free schools. Um, that's another type of state education. Um, 
among many. Um, and so free schools are basically schools which anyone can set up themselves and can establish themselves with help and funding from the government. So if you're a group from uh, a religious institution or, or just a group of people in an area or a group of independent teachers, you can set up a school. And so um, that's been something that's been very contentious, very controversial. Some people think that's a great idea. Some people think that's a terrible idea. And so it's meant that in some places we have schools, state schools, which are very, very different and have completely different ideas about education because they are free schools. So they can basically do what they want in terms of um, the ideas behind the school. So my fiance, for example, works for a free school. She's a science teacher and it's known as the strictest school in Britain. Um, because it's a very, very strict school, but it's a state school. Um, but it's what we call a free school, like I just mentioned. So I think that's also changed things a bit now that we have these schools too. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of variety in the British education system. There's a lot of problems. There's definitely some good things, but I think it's always interesting to see how it compares to the Korean system. Absolutely. Okay, now it's time for our word of the podcast. Over to you, Sam. Today, we've used the word flourish a bit when we were speaking about education. And so flourish is a verb that we use. And it basically means to be very successful or to do very well. Um, So... For example, if you are 11 years old in the UK and you start a new secondary school and after a few weeks, a few months, you get really good grades and you you love it, then you flourish, you are flourishing. It means you are, you are doing very well, you're being, being very successful. Um, but of course, if you find it really difficult and you don't get good grades, then you are not flourishing. However, it's not just for education, we can use it to to talk about many other situations. So you can say, um, I think when I move to this new part of London, I will really flourish. And that means that I will be successful after I move to this new part of London in some way. Um, So Tom, if I start a new job and I do not do very well, I get everything wrong, make lots of mistakes. Am I flourishing or not? You are definitely not flourishing. Exactly. Whereas if I do really well and I make a lot of progress and I do good things for the company, then I flourish. Now it's time for our comment of the podcast. And I have chosen a comment from Neva from our most recent podcast that has been published there, which was on British fashion. It hasn't yet been uploaded to YouTube. So if you're listening to this podcast on YouTube, uh, you will probably see it there by now. The comment is from Wendy, who says, hipster fashion is also popular here in South Korea first image comes up to my mind is an anorak, we might say, the first image. By the way, I reckon another major different attitude towards fashion between UK, we would say the UK, and South Korea is luxuries, especially bags. That's a great point, I think, Wendy, and I think Sam and I would both agree that we've come across that in conversations with students. The attention given to luxury items, particularly bags, uh, particularly among women and girls, is much greater in South Korea than it is in the UK. I think the importance of luxury brands is not something that's particularly popular at the moment among the young in the UK. Brands are important for some people, 
but I think luxury brands are mostly avoided. There are things like Adidas and sort of sports brands that people think are very hip and cool, or some people do. Uh, and the anorak image is an interesting one. Again, I don't think we have got popular anoraks. I don't think the anorak is particularly popular yet in the UK at the moment, but just, I'll look out for just it. Just in Manchester. Just in Manchester. <laughs> but I'll look out for it this winter to see if it has spread to London as well. But thank you for that comment, Wendy, and thank you to everyone who's commenting as well on Naver. We do read those comments as well. So you can comment on whichever platform you prefer, Naver or YouTube. So that's all from us today. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this explanation and discussion of different British schooling systems. We'd be very interested to hear your comments on whether any of this has been surprising and also your comments on what you think of the Korean education system. So thanks very much for listening. It's goodbye from me, Tom. And it's goodbye from me, Sam. Thanks, everyone. Take care.